to do. V. <laughs> well, off to a good start, aren't we? It still gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce your national president. In your lifetime and in mine, there's very few men who have the ability and the dedication to dedicate his life and his abilities to pursuing a goal that is beneficial to people. In Kentucky, we need more volume up. And so we, we have as our national president a man who is committed to a goal, and that's to spend his life and his abilities to improving the welfare of people. Normally, as this type of a man comes to the forefront through his exposure through the educational system, industry would step in and pluck them from the midst of the students and train and teach and guide their pursuits along the interests of industry. It just so happens that they missed one such man, and now we have in our midst one who has the ability, who has compassion for people, and who no doubt has influenced the lives of more farmers and ranchers than any uh, single individual in your lifetime and mine. And so one whom I have learned to appreciate and have a great deal of respect for, who's been a great influence on my life for good, I introduce to you your national president, Orrin Lee Staley. Thank you, Devon. Thank you, Devon, officers, members of the NFO. I don't know where to start tonight, but I know where I intend to finish. And I'm going to start by saying that the launching pad for the American farmers is ready, and now is the hour and now is the time that we unite the forces of American agriculture for fairness, justice, and respect. That's a good start, I think. And it's not for the purpose of idle talk I'm going to lay out to you tonight how they can do it. And I'm going to tell you exactly where we are. But I'm not going into great detail <laughs> of telling you where we are, because I think that's very evident. I think that is evident by our performance in the various commodities. I said this afternoon that I was going to tell you that nine divisions or eight divisions of the NFO, field staff, new membership, cattle, hog, dairy, grain, departments, stockers and feeders. I said six of them, or seven of them, eight of them, then I said. And you know, I missed one. We had nine division departments of the NFO that made progress this year without exception of a department in increasing the volume. I forgot to include the sheep and lamb division. That's a kind of a mistake I like to make. But I'm not going into great detail <coughs> about where we're at structure-wise because the attendance at this convention and what is happening in your own areas and what you know is happening is enough proof. I haven't had people come to me, nor have the department heads, nor the staff, nor anyone that I know of talking about I have a lot of problems in this area or that area. Or talking about the fact their grain payments were slow or something else was happening. Because of the performance overall, 
and because you came here also with your eye on the goal, the goal we've long sought to achieve of uniting our production for the purpose of pricing that production. And I can tell you not only did those departments make progress in volume and increased volume that helped bring about additional performance, but I can tell you tonight that the largest companies in this nation and throughout the world, almost without exception by commodities, and I'd have to name a very few, maybe one or two in a single in any commodity, out of the four or five largest companies, whether it be in dairy, meat, grain, and even in some of the special commodities that are not now already receiving supplies from the NFO. The direct export that's been added in grain, the large companies that have been added to the volume of milk, that they're taking, and the numbers of companies also in cattle, hogs, and across the board. Our ability to handle great increased volume is one that some people question because of the past, the past that we were not able to cope administratively with all the things that we tried to do and that we did do. But I can tell you the trial and error period is over. Then we have the administrative people, the best that money could get, at the head of the various administrative duties, from the computerized systems to the management of those systems. Then in grain, for example, we have seven grain accounting offices throughout the nation. In Fresno, California, in Portland, Oregon, in Minneapolis, in Shawnee Mission close to Kansas City, in Clarksville, Tennessee, and Andover, Illinois, and Delaware, Ohio. And I believe I named Clarksville, Tennessee in it. If I didn't, I should have. I tried to go around the circle. We have 35 offices throughout the United States that we have AOM, every office management people in. And in each of these offices, we have people trained, not just in our own system, but in most cases, vast experience in past systems. That could immediately, now that a system is once set up and once structured, has the capabilities of rapid expansion because you have somebody that can manage. And you can put a lot of additional people there and in two or three days, you can have a great extra workload because it's not hard once you have computerized programs and you have them programmed, you know you can put a lot more something to them. I don't know what it is, but it comes out the way you need it if it went in correctly. We have 250 livestock collection points operatable throughout the nation. We have 18 barge loading points up the river system that are either member owned or we have full access to. 40 rail loading points, either membership owned or ones that we have access to that I would call complete access, use as we want to, that the livestock collection points that extend from the coast to coast for the use not just of hogs but also of cattle and stockers and feeders with a few additions that are available. Then we have the milk reloads that are necessary to be able to bring in and collect the milk. But that system that I'm talking about is from coast to coast and border to border. Then many of those systems are also put on the computer system, centralized computers. 
All of this that started in 1971 when they told us it would take five years, they meaning the best company we could find, that it would take five years to put the system together. I didn't think it should take five months, let alone five years. But it did. And not only did we hire the best firm we could find to put a system together, then we had to find the best management firm we could in the United States to help train the people to manage it. And then we had to go find the best people we could in addition to the fine people we had to be able to absolute management or have absolute management of the structure and system. But you had to have it in order to have the backup delivery system for collective bargaining. And we've got it. And I say that and spend only that time to give you that assurance that the money that you've spent and the effort you've spent has built the only nationwide system coordinated in this nation, not only for collection, delivery, and dispatch of products, but probably undoubtedly the most complicated system of accounting and computerized system of checks and balances because that was necessary also to be able to know what you were doing and how you were doing it and to be able to have the growth that was necessary. And so we arrive at the hour, an hour of great need, a critical time in the history of American agriculture, more critical than you and I suspect more critical than you and I realize, more critical than we ever thought would probably happen in our lifetime. And somebody's going to say, yes, NFO has always talked about a crisis, that there's always something there that's a crisis, that's right. Time and time again, we've took action and we've gotten some results that I feel has contributed to saving millions of farmers in this country, or hundreds of thousands of them that went into a million, probably, in my estimation. Because the plans were there that only a few should remain. But the counteracting force of the NFO has been a contributing factor. But I want to try to get it down to understandable terms what I'm talking about. You know, it took, and I'm not old enough to remember for certain, but it took two or three years to go broke in the Depression, really. <clears throat> and I've seen farmers hang on for two decades, and now just going by the wayside. But let me tell you what has happened in a few months' time. Let me tell you what's happened, and I think you know what's happened. And that is, in a few months' time, we've seen the farm prices drop and our costs continue to rise to where that if you were to have sat down 10 years ago and said, this is unwritten down, this is the amount of money I think that I'll have and my family will have when I retire, and then you would now write down on the other side of the tablet the amount of your operating expenses in 1976, I would guess that there would hardly be an exception. They wouldn't find their operating expenses were higher in 1976 than they thought they'd even be worth when we were here at the convention 10 years ago in 1966. Now, if, it, if you haven't taken me seriously yet, I'll bring it down, not to ask anybody a personal question, but I just wonder how many people are here and how many people would like to have come that couldn't afford it, that don't want to admit it, that won't tell anybody but I'll bet you 
that there are a lot of people in this audience and throughout this country, ranchers, farmers, growers, that if they sit down and you put over in the side of your mind how much you owe in short-term credit, in dollars and cents to the banker, the PCA, or FHA on one hand, one side of your brain, and then on the other side of your brain, don't put down the figures that you try to convince your banker that your livestock equipment and dairy cows and grains worth, but put down what you really think it would bring if you had to sell out. And I'll bet you there's a high percentage of the American farmers numbering more than 50% of the active farmers in this country that their livestock, machinery, grain, whatever type of farming operation they have that will not pay off their short-term credit today. And that's happened in a few months' time. I didn't expect to get much applause from that because it's a sobering thought, isn't it? I wanted you to think because I want to see if we're willing to accept the challenge. I want to see if we have the fortitude. And I want to see if we really believe in fighting for justice in this country. That we really believe what we've said. That whether or not we believe that we have the opportunity and the necessity to do it. I know you here from Maine to California, from Texas to the Canadian border, there's practically no area left uncovered in between. But some of the first people that I met coming from far away Maine and followed by California and all points in between in the same way across the other points of the country. We had to have the scope. We had to have the capabilities. And we had to realize, which we probably didn't, I didn't, of all the things we'd have to do that we didn't expect to have to do. We all thought that it was only, only necessary to get the production together, have a holding action, and then all the things were going to be done and we wouldn't have to do anything else. Well, our holding actions achieved the success that they had to achieve at the time, but not total success. We fought for the recognition, proving to companies that they had to deal with us, and that took from 58 to 65. And then when we started delivering production, that's when we really had problems. And then we started putting together the nationwide collection dispatch and delivery system. And as we did that, we went through a trial and error period. And as we have put that structure together, and I said the most complicated computerized structure system, because you know a company buys so many hogs or so much grain from a certain elevator or a certain buying station or whatever it means. We have to trace it from the individual member through bargaining, through to the company, to the collection, back through to the individual farmer. That's a long, complicated course. That's the reason it took so long to do it. But it had to be if you were going to bargain. If you were going to merchandise and buy and sell, you wouldn't have had to done it, as all the old systems have because all you could do is buy and pay for what was brought in and sell it out at a higher price or lower the price of what you bought next and make the profit to make up for the losses that maybe you didn't know where it came from the first time. But we in bargaining are taking it back to the individual member. Their production tracked through. And so we have the system and enough for that. What can we do to use that system now that we have it? You're going to have to make the decision. 
You're going to have to make decisions here in this convention in the next few hours. We're going to be going into commodity meetings to establish price goals to go out and fight for, to establish dollar and cents figures that we will strive to achieve, commodity by commodity. But you know, if we don't make up our minds to work and drive and to drive ourselves to do more and call on others to do it, and that means calling on all the old leaders to do what they can, calling on new leaders, getting additional new members to help, then we'd just as well not have those commodity meetings tomorrow, had we? And if we don't have them, you know what you can look forward to? Oh, yes, I know with a new president, there's always those that are thinking somebody is going to be Santa Claus. And they're going to put their shoes on for us and walk down the road, you know. But I can tell you that if you depend enough on government to get you the cost of production plus a reasonable profit, You're sure dreaming like there's a Santa Claus and a real one. And if you get government participating enough to assure you the cost of production plus a reasonable profit, they'll dominate you too in the end. because it'll be necessary with a cost to move in to protect their investments too, you know, and to tell you you can only do this or you can only do that. There are minimum things they can do to protect us in the place of catastrophe or in times of catastrophe. But let me tell you tonight that there wasn't a steel company waiting to ask anybody what they were going to do about a 6 or 7% increase in the steel price, was there? I haven't heard of George Meany coming out and asking anybody what wages labor ought to have, have you? What's wrong with the American farmer? Why don't you do it, and why don't you see the necessity of doing it? Well, you know, the Arabs that rode a camel 20 years ago are smarter than the farmers. They got the oil price anyway, didn't they? Well, I won't say they're smarter than the farmers, but I guess there's no other way to really say it. I hope that this convention, as the OPEC oil nations meet, I hope this convention becomes the answer to OPEC, the oil nations that are going to raise the price of oil, that we say, go ahead and raise the price of oil. You can raise our price of fertilizer, but we've got more food than you have oil, and the American farmers are going to start pricing the food in this country and this world. No, it's great. And I appreciate applause, but I want it to be meant. And I know you meant it. You would like to have it. You'd like to see that strength. But the question comes back, are you going to do it? You have it in your own hands. I have visited with company after company, top executive in many of the fields in this country, in every major commodity field. And almost without exception, I have had the large company presidents tell me privately, we're not concerned to pay a decent price to the farmers. Our concern is whether the companies other companies can buy cheaper. And I and other members of the staff 
have represented you by telling them that that's the reason we have to be nationwide. And that if we put together enough of the production in all areas of this nation, that when they sign a contract, that we can deliver production from any area in the nation, that there will be no areas that other companies can buy cheaper other than transportation difference, because we'll move it out of those areas, and the farmers or ranchers or growers in those areas will have to, at that time, meet that price or about everybody had joined the NFO in the area. And they believe it, that it would work. They believe this is possible. But the thing that they've said time after time, the NFO is right. You could do it. But will the farmers do it? And they don't believe they will. Some of them said we can buy out a farmer for a nickel. All we have to do is to raise the price a nickel and you can't keep them together. And that's what they're fearful of. And so it's not the companies that I feel that the great fight is involved in anymore. Not that they love us. Not that they like us. But there's a mutual interest. And that is stability in the movement of agricultural production, price stability. So you're going to really have a choice. You can go home from this convention, and you can make your plans for another year of loss financially. It's about what it amounts to. You can make your plans as you go home. Probably what will be the loss. Oh, yes, there's two things that we've had problems with, three things that have to be overcome. One is we have to get across to the people if there's still a question in their mind, and there is in some areas, in some cases. Remembering what happened five years ago or ten years ago or two years ago or three years ago, and they believe it's the same now. And I wondered how to explain this. And the other, not too long ago, I was in the Oklahoma City Airport getting on a plane late at night to go to the Texas State Convention. And I saw something there that gave me an idea that might help you explain that, and it probably won't work the way it worked for me in my own mind, of how in simple ways to explain that we're the same organization with the same goals, but with greatly improved and many times the capabilities that we had even two years ago. But I looked up there, and the ceiling was hanging a replica of the Wright Brothers' first airplane. And immediately it hit me, you know, the first time they tried to fly when they jumped out of the barn loft, it didn't work with their wings, did it? But they didn't quit believing that the plane, that they could fly, did they? And so they flew that first plane. And I'm sure that this one's a lot better model than that one was, really, probably, because at least it had three good rubber tires on it. Bicycle type cars with about a bicycle seat where you sat right out there and looked right down the runway if they had a runway with the wings wide together and a motor that he could have probably reached up behind. And I believe that history tells us it flew 146 feet. But it flew, didn't it? And today, there are test pilots that are flying planes that are going 2,200 miles an hour. They're going to fly across this nation in less than two hours' time. The progress 
that we have made and the ability now to be able to move. My estimation in Hanlon is comparable to the 2,200 mile airplane that a test pilot can fly across this country. Another thing, we have a problem, we just well admit it. And that problem is that farmers don't want to admit they're in problems. They're living in a dream world, and I don't know which comes first, but they're dreaming of $10 soybeans, $65 cattle, 64-hour hogs, 12-hour milk, and they go to bed every night dreaming that it's going to happen, but they don't know how. And so they won't admit it to each other that really the banker probably already owns their dairy herds, their livestock, and their equipment, and their grain. He just hasn't taken title yet. But in Nebraska, there's a few places the bankers are taking title and some other places. But we've heard where mass sales are already being announced. What do we have to do? First, we have to believe we can do it. But in order to believe we can do it, we have to be firmly convinced we're right. And we have to have the pride and the self-confidence that we're right and we're capable of doing it. But the fact that if we believe we are right, it ought to give us enough confidence to do it, hadn't it? It seems to me that it has. Right. You know, I can't claim any of the heritage of Harry Truman, only the fact that there were a few things that were pretty typical in Missouri, you know. I guess they said they were stubborn as a mule and everything else, you know. And he said the buck stops here. But I believe that same type of understanding and belief is out in many areas of this country. And I wonder, if somebody said to me the other day, what would our ancestors that settled this nation as farmers think of the farmers in 1976 if they were to drop back and take a look at them compared to what happened to the rest of the economy? Those that were willing to stand up to fight, to die for what is right, to build a heritage today. And the people today aren't even proving that they're willing to fight to preserve it. And you know it's right. You've got every excuse in the world from the fact that you don't want to hurt or insult your milk driver, truck driver, or that you don't want to hurt the feelings of a guy that's bought your livestock over the years, or you don't want to step on somebody's toe and make the guy at the elevator mad, or you don't want to put in a few extra hours to go a little farther with your production sometimes, to be able to get it into a new pattern and put it together with all the farmers in this nation throughout the nation that are a part of the NFO. Are those things sign of courage? Are those the type of things that we're proud of? I'll tell you when I'll be proud. When we go to the marketplace together as farmers and say, this is our product, this is our price, and you're either going to pay it or you don't get it, and that's when we've got courage, and not until that day comes. I can't make you do it. I don't have any way to make you do it. You have to have the desire to do it. 
I was even in the Navy when I saw them saw a few people in the brig and never really helped much, but it did kind of bring people's attention around once in a while. But you don't have it. You have to have the desire. But you also have to know how to do it. How to put that structure together. How to have the communication. And so that comes down to how do we do it? How do we do it? It takes a lot of people doing a little. The structure that we're going to recommend from this convention and lay out to you is not a structure that's going to take a lot of time, but it's a structure that's going to call for performance. It's a structure that's going to require your effort, your understanding, and your willingness to do it. Your ability to convince others, and some of you doubt that ability, but you know what a part of the doubt of that ability is? You haven't willing, been willing to lay your own prestige on the line by asking somebody else to help you. You haven't been confident enough many times to say, let's go with the NFO, I want you to help me. Or I want you to put your production through with me so we can price our product. That takes confidence, doesn't it? But it also takes using your influence and laying it on the line and helping people make decisions. We have proven I believe without a question of a doubt that we organize farmers throughout this nation in 48 states of the continental United States faster than any group of people have ever been organized of that scope in this nation. I don't think anybody, labor, any present day group, anybody else can say they ever approached what we did and what we've done. We proved that we had the best communication system that this nation has ever seen. We proved that we could get out a message of what we wanted done, that I could sit at my desk, get two short paragraphs typed up at noon, and it would be to almost every farmer in every corner of this nation in eight hours' time. A communication system on Mac. But then we went into the commodities and we abused that system and we found that it wouldn't work. And we've been going back to reevaluate why it didn't. Well, the first thing with the old Minuteman system, everybody, as soon as we started moving commodities, wanted a meeting and everybody representing a commodity wanted a meeting. And it wasn't long until we were using the system that we'd have a hog meeting, a cattle meeting, a dairy meeting, a grain meeting, maybe all the same night that the three different times the system had been asked to put out the word. But the biggest problem was we had a dairyman calling a cattleman, a cattleman calling a hogman. Maybe you all would put it the other way, the hogman calling the cattleman and he didn't like it. On down through the commodity not matching. We're going to present to you a commodity Minuteman structure that we've already initiated in grain and are initiating in other commodities and have been working on it and making some variations. But I want to explain that, what it means. You take one man in the county or one lady that's county coordinator. They get four assistant community chairmen, or four community chairmen. Four more people throughout the county somewhere. Each of the community chairmen get three assistant community chairmen. And they have four people to inventory under them. Do you know how many names that is, with starting with one person, with four community chairmen and three assistant community chairmen, who have four people under them each, 
and community chairman and commu assistant community chairman are the right words. We're not going to ask those people to go 50 miles from home. We're asking them to take care of it in their own community. Do you know how many names that is in the county? With nobody making more than four contacts, it's 66 names with an alternate thrown in for the county coordinator. And let's use grain just as an example. And we have more than a thousand grain counties in the NFO that has organization in those counties. What do you think that would mean if each one of those 66 just averaged 15,000 bushel of grain a year? How many bushel of grain is that in the county? 66 people averaging 15,000 bushel. Not much either. How many bushel is that? How many bushel is it? How many? Anybody say a million bushel? Huh? Anybody say a million bushel? All right. If we had just a thousand counties with a structure like that performing, a thousand counties with a million bushel, how much is that? How much? How much? Say it loud. A billion bushel. And do I ask you a question? That if you had a billion bushel of grain united in that system, that where you can put blocks of grain together 10 times a year, of that that's on farm storage, if you wouldn't have a great influence in the market, Anybody doesn't believe it? I can apply that to hogs. I can apply it to dairy. And what I'm saying is we proved in this country that we could organize faster than anybody else. And I don't think that anybody ever, ever had a communication system that any way is near equal. The NFO communication system. How many of you have been a part of a Minuteman system in some time gone by? Quite a few of you. It worked, didn't it? Yeah, everybody did their job. There wasn't too much to do. While well, we had a faster system in the Associated Press, UPI, and almost beat TV. <laughs> and we can still do it. And I won't say anything about the accuracy or inaccuracy, but I bet it was read right down to the last word as each one read their, their sentence off. Because it's our business, it's our business we're taking care of, and it's a system we're going to have to have. Now, what am I saying? We've looked, we've tried to put it together, we proved that we were the best group to organize that this country's ever seen, the best communication structure and I want to prove without a question of doubt in the next 90 days that we can organize and mass production of farmers throughout this nation faster than anybody ever thought it could be done, too. And that structure will be laid out. And not only is it laid out in the inventory forms that will be sent in to those offices I talk throughout the country, We'll know who's inventorying. We'll know who's not doing their job. And that's when the staff can be called upon to do something to help. But we can't do it if the desire isn't there. And if the desire isn't there, out of this convention, we're going to lose our great opportunity to do the job. So we have the capabilities and we have the ability. We have the production. And I've had many questions asked when we talk about Operation 30, now added the word clincher. Do you think it's possible, they say, that NFO could possibly double, triple, or quadruple their strength in a short time? 
And I said, I'm confident of it. Because only a few of us know the capabilities. I could tell you about the companies and name them that are willing to take vast amounts of production in addition to what they're getting. Companies, international companies, direct exports and grain that we've lined up, that we have the capabilities now of delivering to a system that we started out with a few months ago that's been greatly improved and reduced costs and the capabilities of delivery. But you are the ones that's got to do it. And somebody said, what are you going to say before I came on the platform? I said, well, I'm going to say all the staff can work three days a week and all the members can spend 30 minutes a week for the next 90 days. That's all I'm expecting of them. You know that kind of work, how much results we get? It's only going to come out what we put into it. And that was we got recognition. We had to use a holding action to get written contracts. We got all those. They've been achieved. They're no problem. We don't have any problem now with the companies getting recognition and moving production to them. We don't have any worry about a written contract. But what would a holding action do unless you've got the system to deliver to back it up? It wouldn't do much, would it? Only maybe create more problems than it might cure at this particular junction, junction. But what about it if it is used, if necessary, when we have the production united and the way to deliver it? I want it clearly understood by everybody without question that I believe that it's likely that a holding action in a showdown time will come for farmers to achieve equity and justice and respect. I believe that. So what is Operation 30 all about? Operation 30 is this, that we unite 30% of the nation's total agricultural production by various commodities going through the NFO nationwide collection dispatch and delivery system. That last part some people want to forget. They want a shortcut. Go out and sign it up and pledge and have a pipe dream and think that everybody will be with you without having the understanding and the legal documents to back it up, and I'll tell you what will happen. It will evaporate just as fast as you got it. We can go with experiments. We've tried them all that I know of, and I'm willing to try more. But I want us to one time one-time leaders in this organization that are here at home. Everybody that can walk with a cane or get in a wheelchair and ride. And every the youngest member that is here or back home. That I want us to pledge that for the next 90 days, we're going to turn every corner of this country upside down saying to the American farmers, <coughs> you've tried everything else. You've always hoped. You've always looked for the Santa Claus. And once in a while he appeared for a couple of years and then you thought he'd always be there. Whatever the cause may be. But I want us to pledge that this convention, I want us to pledge to ourselves that all of us, 
in one 90-day period beginning next Monday <coughs> that we're going to tie this agricultural production together. And we're going to use the same economic policies and the economic strength and the economic soundness when companies price their products or when labor strikes for a wage or when the OPEC nations announce their oil prices. I want the American farmers to be able to announce their prices and to have the fortitude, the courage, and the production to back it up. That's what we started out to do, and I don't want to see us put it off. Now, it may mean missing a bowling night. It may mean missing a sale. It may mean missing coffee a few mornings, somewhere. It may mean a lot of things that might inconvenience you just a little. Because I want to talk about something else. I talked about a structure. <coughs> There's two things we did in organizing that we've got to do now. You know, there's a lot of people that won't make an individual decision. What we used to do, we would beg anybody that would to get three or four or five people together to talk about it, wouldn't we? We forgot how, maybe. And then you remember the missionaries. Oh, there's some of you looking around here. You were going to help for a week, you know. Some of it turned out a little while longer. But I'm not trying to get you to do more than what I'm going to ask you. If you become willing, it won't be turned down, of course. But what I'm saying is this. We found one thing. One thing was that if we set up 10 people to go out in the county on a certain day, and I want the wives to listen to this. One day, or for three days in a row, I can tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> well, the cows will get out, or the flat car, or something will happen, and they won't get there on time, part of them, and by three days, it's all, filled, uh, it's all done. But we found one way that that would, could be prevented. And that was we take the farmer, the member, far enough away from home that he can't get back easy at night. And we found the ideal mileage was 100 miles. If we asked them to go three or 400, oh, they were scared to death because they were afraid a catastrophe would happen, they couldn't get back. But even at a 55 mile an hour speed limit, you can make it in a couple hours, you know, and you might break the speed limit and beat that a little. And the wives don't need to worry about them because they get the heck worked out of them because everybody has to eat together at supper. Not that any wives would worry about them anyway. But anyway, they get to, they eat together at, at supper. That's what I know as supper. Sophisticated dinner, I, I think, turned around, you know. And they eat breakfast together. They talk about it. They go out in pairs. And so what we want to do is every county to be ready <coughs> that when somebody calls and says that on Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock we want 10 people from your county to go as missionaries. The missionaries, if there's money somewhere to pay for their meals, it will be done, but probably that will be volunteer work. You know, you'll not only learn a lot about the NFO when you have to answer farmers why in other counties, but you'll learn a lot about farming, too, from others, just visiting with them. Now, why do we bring them back to the same place at night and so they eat supper and breakfast together? Well, you know what will happen? The first thing you know, if you don't do that, they'll get acquainted with Joe the first day they're out and the next day they'll look at his farm and the next day they'll look at somebody else's and nothing's done. They just get to visiting. Being very frank, very firm, very honest about it. But I'll tell you what. 
you take 10 people from a county and then get 10 people that you got acquainted with to come back to your county, and you have 20 people, 10 teams of people going up and down those roads, you'll turn rural America upside down, whether it's in Maine, California, Texas, or any place in between. That takes organization. That takes the structure to do it. That takes our ability to do it. To do it. What is Operation 30, the clincher? That simply means that we unite 30% of the nation's total production going through the nationwide collection, dispatch, and delivery system or ready to go through it. At least we would fudge that much. And then what are we going to do? We're going to then to get together and vote on the cost of production plus a reasonable profit in areas not bigger than 10 county areas by commodities with telephonic communication between the places that the meetings are being held so that when we get through, we have an announced price. And then we'll announce it to the world. And if, and if the companies will not then sign contracts at the cost of production plus a reasonable profit, then there will be an all-out holding action. We'll be ready. We'll be prepared. We'll have the strength. But I don't want to go out hunting an elephant with a BB gun, and I'm not going to be a part of leadership leading people over a cliff but I'll pledge to you one thing. There's nobody will scare me. There's nobody going to make a deal with me, and I'll lead you to victory if you'll get in there and fight with all everybody helping. And I'll stay in there with all the courage and determination there is. But I'm not going to lead a bunch of weak-kneed people that are not willing to get involved in a fight into a fight either. And there's only one way you're going to do it, and that is to do what I've asked you to do. I'm no hero. I don't appreciate applause. I'm natural, of course, from the point I've got pride in what I'm doing. I've got pride in being a part of what we've done and what we've accomplished. But applause for the sake of applause is not ego building to me. Ego building to me is ego building together a system and a structure that will give us justice, that will give us fairness, and I have added the word respect. And why have I added the word respect? All my life there has been a feeling from others throughout this country that they were just a little bit better than the farmers. It hasn't always been said, but it's always been imitated, imitated or initiated, hasn't it? That we would take it, and then when I see people charge us the prices that they want to charge us, and I see the price tags that go on, I want the American farmers to get in the same ball game that the large companies that price their products with a price tag or labor bargains and uses a strike if necessary. And I picked up the local paper. I hardly ever read a newspaper anymore, articles about the NFO, because I don't care. I don't care what's said. Really? Why don't I? Because we're not going to do anything illegal, and we're not going to do anything immoral, in my opinion. I can live with my conscience, and I'm not going to let anybody influence me to weaken my position as leader of the NFO to wage the fight. And so I did happen to glance at the paper, the headlines, that I call for a strike. I don't care what they call it, strike, holding action, or whatever they want to call it. I want the American farmers to say this is our price, and we're going to get it, and you're either going to pay it or you're not going to get the food in simple, understandable terms. I don't care anything else. And 
and I want us to do it in a businesslike way, fairness, determination for justice. We've got a job to do, decide what our price goes, not the cost of production plus a reasonable profit formulation all the way, but the basis of it will be the cost of production plus a reasonable profit formulation. It's not too difficult. Farmers know what the costs are. Somebody said, no, you can't figure it. It won't be uniform. Well, I'd like to know any statistical information that involves a lot of people that was ever uniform or is ever accurate for anybody else or everybody. You know, you pick up the paper and you read a parity formula. They took an average, didn't they? Right? Some may have received a little more, some may have received a little less. But we farmers are not stupid. We know what it takes to produce corn or hogs or cattle or milk. And we know what it costs for each one of those items, don't we? And we can average it out. And on top of that, we've heard but never experienced it for any length of time, if ever, that industry expects a 10% profit after cost of management and labor. That's not too hard to figure on the investment, is it? You ask a businessman in your local community how many years he wants to amateurize a building he might buy or build. It all figures out pretty much the same. What are we going to do with this convention? Are we willing to make our pledge? Are we willing to say that we will really put our shoulders to the wheel for the next 90 days come Monday? Are we willing to say that NFO is coming first, not for the sake of NFO? I'm not asking you to do it for NFO. I'm not going to be asking you to do it for Ornley Staley. I'm urging you to do it for yourself for your families, for your future, and for stability. To maintain and protect the greatest food producing factory in the world, the American family type farm. And I don't want you to look back someday and say you failed to do it because you didn't take the time to do it at a certain time. In several minor commodities, it's already happened. The only way you can sell production is through a contract. You know what the big danger is? When you can't get credit from normal credit sources, companies will offer you the credit. And I suspect that we're going to find, sad to say, that one of the biggest villains is going to be the cooperative movement in this to tie up production by loaning credit or advancing credit and tie up the sale of production. That isn't vertical integration, that's direct integration, direct control. And that can happen very quickly. And so I want to say to you, that every time that I think about holding up my hand in our meetings, in our areas, saying this is our price, we voted on it, there's a tinge that goes down my back. It would be the proudest day that the American farmers ever had, with the pride and the ego of fairness, not an ego of injustice, and not an ego of getting even with somebody, but the ego to know that you had accomplished what is most worthwhile besides your spiritual needs in this world, and that is your human needs 
of survival, the human need of adequate protection for what you've achieved or sought to achieve, and for the feeling that you had passed on to generations in the future a system and a structure that would be with them, and that you had passed on to the other segment of the economy that is not now organized, equity, justice, fairness, and respect. And that you could then participate as part of the world of helping feed the hungry and maybe teaching them with a system that has a heart, a system that has a purpose, a system that's made up of human beings that are individuals, the American family type farm. That is what we can achieve. That is our opportunity. There's enough strength in this hall scattered throughout the nation with the help of everybody to do it. And I hope that what comments that I have, that I have said, will make you feel guilty between now and planning time of doing anything other than serving as a missionary or serving as a part of a structure in your county. I set out to achieve that tonight for your benefit and for the benefit of the American farmers. I can't do it, the staff can't do it. And I want to close with an example of what I said in Michigan, and my voice has been a little raspy since, speaking out in that wet day up there. Ron and some of the other guys didn't mind it and enjoyed it, but we had a dairy meeting. And you know what happened? And I want to try to get this across to, for you to understand bargaining and its effect. We had an opportunity up there, a contract, a fulfill a milk contract, that the total capacity could be 36, 35, 36 million pounds of milk a month. Present capacity, 25, 26, and we're supplying about a third of it. And we weren't building as fast as we should. It's with a major company. It's also in the area, I guess a little pride, nothing more than this. But it's a little pride, I guess. It happens to be in the area of a guy that once wrote an editorial, a square wheel wagon, he called the NFO, and his wagon's not running so smooth these days. And we have a chance there, irrespective of that. I'm talking about bargaining, I'm talking about price. And I said, you've got the, one of the greatest bargaining opportunities to put another 20 million pound of milk together quickly that we've probably ever had in the NFO and the effect on the price of milk. And I want to know why we got out of the rain into a tent. The first guy said, you know, we're nine cents out of the market. The next guy said, well, the, I don't see how they can take on more milk. Our truckers have to wait now. The next guy said, we need st more staff. The next guy said, you know, I don't know whether you got a contract or not. I've never seen a copy of it. By that time, I was about ready to pull my hair. I said, nine cents below the market. I said, you've lost the value of milk in the last 60 days, a dollar a hundred weight, and haven't done a thing about it. But I said, more important is, you know, and if you're not dairymen, they calibrate the dairy tanks, you know. And that's the weight of the milk that's taken off the farm, and this load of milk that I was telling them about in Missouri, and it better be factual because if I ever get caught not telling a fact, you know what's going to happen to me. They're going to hang me to the closest tree somewhere if it's tall enough, you know. 
And that point I said, you know, we just I just came from the office. And we took a load of milk and didn't have a chance to change the calibration on those, on those dairy farmers dairy tanks in their home on their farm. And we weighed the semi and it weighed 2,000 pounds more than the calibration showed on the farm. I said, somebody's been stealing 2,000 pounds of milk. And they've been out paying us 11 cents. They didn't outpay us, they outstole us, you know. Or just plain stole it. And he said we were 9 cents under the market. Hard to compete with. The next thing, the truckers. I said, you know, I thought you paid the truckers to haul the milk. And if they had to take a little time to unload, that's what you paid them for. The third point was as far as the contract. I said, I don't want a written contract a lot of times now. There's no real formulation you can go with. I'd rather have a verbal contract in a lot of places where we're moving more production. And then I said, staff. Well, I said, you know what? We could put a thousand staff people in the state of Michigan Monday morning, and then we'd probably equal all the buyers of farm products in the Michigan, maybe one for one. And boy, what a debate we can have. We can get in everybody's the barn lot or everybody's dairy barn, and we can have a debate one for one on everybody that's buying agricultural products or field men farm. And we can have the doggondest debate you ever saw. I said, you know who's going to win it? But I said, first, before I say that, I said, you know, you've got the greatest bargaining opportunity. That's enough milk to take milk from every buyer in the state of Michigan. Scattered over the entire state, it's a big enough volume. And I said, what effect will that have on the price of milk in the state of Michigan? Every buyer will be bidding up to keep it from leaving them, won't it? And that's the use and exercising of bargaining powers you build. And the last point I want to leave with you. I said we can hire a thousand staff men Monday morning if we could find them. And we can start the debate. But I can tell you who can beat the staff men, who can beat the employees of any company or representatives of any group. And that's the farmers and ranchers in their area that sit there over coffee and simply say, it's time we got together, it's time we united our production, it's time we stuck together until we got our price. And farmers and ranchers talking that in every community can be tens of thousands of hired personnel from any company, any group, anybody else. They've got it in their own hands. Their destiny is in their own hands. All they have to decide to do is to use the strength they have as American farmers together, and then they'll have the independence that they think they've got now that ends when the banker decides it no longer exists. They can establish their independence they're so proud of, and it'll be real independence, and that's in your hands, and that's in the hands of this convention. And I pledge to you that your people, your officers, your members of the board of directors, the staff, and everybody else will put their shoulders to the wheel. But that isn't enough. That isn't enough, and the people that really are going to benefit are the ones that's got the production, the ones that want to establish a future for their children and their grandchildren, and the ones that believe in justice and fairness and respect that is deserved the American farmer. Thank you.
How many of you remember that little sign that Winston Churchill flashed in the depths of their most dis greatest despair, you know? We ain't in that kind of despair now. But let's really say what that means. For the American farmer, that's what it's all about. Come on, let's get in the miles. Let's walk for NFL. Let's go. Let's go. Microphone number seven. Microphone number seven. Microphone number seven. Thank <laughs> you. 
about 30% of our hogs. How about the rest of you? Come on, let's go for Michigan. Let's get behind it, the whole thing. I like talk here on microphone numbers. Come well, on, you Minnesotans. We got the vice president elect. We can get this 30% thing, right? Great. Let's go. you guys let's get off that rear and get in gear try to do slip your clutch or something you're gonna fall flat on it if you don't get going come on let's hear a hoot and a holler right now Whoa! was Traverse County, Minnesota. There was the first well, let's hear it again. 30% hogs. You guys can still holler you're not horse yet, are you? Come on, let's go. Whoop up, hooray. Hey, for an FO. When the saints go marching in, when the saints go marching in, Oh, how I want to be in that number. Oh, when the saints go marching in. One time for New York. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, how I want to be in that number. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Any more states here? Come on, let's hear it. I think you're all froze yet. Come on. Let's get New York and New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Come on, the East Coast, get out there. Let's make that hip, hip, hooray. Let's go all the way in 77. Microphone 7 wants to give a hoot and a holler. Microphone 7. Okay. Microphone number 7. We just had the South rise in the presidential election. Let's see you guys act like you rose again. I'm from North Dakota. You guys from the South. Let's hear it from you. Let's hear it for Bogle Brothers of Roanoke, Are you Illinois. northerners going to let those southerners out, do you? They didn't do yeah, much, so let's, let's do let's, some more. Come on, another hoot and a holler. Hooray! Come on, let's go! <laughs> Iowa! Let's hear it! Microphone seven turned on. Right here, I'd like microphone number seven. I'd like to say a word if you don't mind. Hello, Nebraska. Let's go. Okay, microphone number seven. This is J.C. Trout from Crawford County, Missouri. I'm number 378 on the national. I'm number 378 members and the national organization. And I want you to know that this to me seems like a half-hearted effort here tonight. I want you to know that the speech that Orrin Lee Staley made is not near strong enough as far as I'm concerned. I want you to know that I've been in this organization a long time and I've worked for it. And the only thing it takes to make this organization work is guts of the members. 
I want to say to you people that I don't think you got guts enough to make it work. There isn't anything that our national office or our staff can do to make that FO work unless the members care to make it work. And unless you want to go home and put your production in a block and make it stick there until it sells for a price, you ain't going to get a damn cent nowhere. And I don't think you people got guts enough to make it go. It takes guts to make an organization work, and I don't see it here. And I haven't seen it for 19 years. And I'm ready to make it go, and I defy any man here. I'll hold any product that I have, and I farm several thousand acres. And I'll hold it till we get a price. And I defy you all to do the same. And until you do, you're not going to get a thing. Say them's fighting words. Let's get at him. Let's get on the go. Let's make it look like you mean it. You're walking around here, crawling around the floor. That's who for them. Come on, Kansas. Let's make it work. Pennsylvania, let's hear it from you. Hello, boy. Michigan. Ohio. North Dakota. New York. Idaho, Nebraska, not you, Tiberti, just Nebraska, Georgia. If I've got a promise, if you can raise this roof with a yell, Charlie Renfro and Glenn Utley are going to do a poke tomorrow night. Is there anything else you want right now, Tiberti? <laughs> Kentucky, let's hear it from you. Where's New York? Where? Colorado. Microphone Minnesota. Yay. Let's hear it again. 30 South Dakota. 30% for New York, Missouri, Utah, what an NFO, Chip and go, what about Montana, Montana, oh come on Montana, let's go, Montana, that includes Adam Schweitzer, yeah, how about that? Iowa again. Two is on. Iowa. Chippewa. Kansas. Montana. Montana. California. Oh, hey. That was Tom Conrad talking Ohio. I better get going. <laughs> <laughs> Iowa County, Iowa. <laughs> Indiana. <laughs> Michigan. Oklahoma. Colorado. <laughs> Washington. <laughs> Where's New York? Ohio. New York. Mike number seven. Come on. Yeah. Willie Stroop out here, and I'd just like to tell that man that said we don't have the guts that maybe the men don't, but the ladies do. Come on, it, ladies. Did you hear that? She said if the men don't have the guts, the women do. Let's go. More power to them. Mike number one. Come on for Illinois. Come on, Montana. Yay! We like to.
Can I have those mics, please? Come it's on. <laughs> what are we talking about? I come with my one. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to sing it? We're from Iowa. <laughs> hey, how about one for Iowa County, Iowa? Yeah! Hey! <laughs> Wisconsin. Steve Pavich says you still don't know how to holler. Let's go, Wisconsin. Let's call the roll again. Ohio. Ohio. Yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. South Dakota. Hey, Charlie. Oklahoma. By gosh, we had a challenge one time. We were going to float Wisconsin right away with milk, and we're still going to do it for Michigan. Ohio. Michigan. Ohio. <laughs> Where's that? Georgia. Here they are, Sam Cleary and the rest of them. <laughs> Indiana. Hey, where's New York? New York. NFO. Hey. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, hey. sound off. Kansas. Vermont. Vermont, let's go. NFO, help Vermont. Minnesota. Morrison County. Where's Maine? California. Maine's up there on the northern border of the state.